Okay, welcome everyone this evening to the Crossroads webinar series. Um, this, I think, is the, the ninth or tenth episode in our series of, um, uh, of content and information uh, that we wish to share with you. The thinking behind this is really that there's a real lack of awareness of what learning difficulties are in um, the educational marketplace. And um, <clears throat> whilst there may be uh, an understanding of what a learning difficulty might be, how to communicate that and share that with, um, with parents, with, um, with colleagues, and uh, how, how to manage it is often quite, quite difficult. Um, just a few housekeeping rules. Please could everyone turn their videos off, uh, except for the panelists, and please could you keep your, um, your mute buttons um, on as well. So mute, yeah, mute on. Um, and uh, we will work through all the panelists this evening. Um, we have Yasmin Ghani, who is the head of our foundation phase at Crossroads School. Um, Andrea, who is our um, occupational therapist. Um, Olga Skirpus is a, a grade three educator and a parent. Um, Yasmin's also a parent. And then we've got Georgina Dempster, who is um, a parent as well, <laughs> but also she's our educational psychologist. So she'll be coming to us from that, from that perspective. Um, tonight's webinar is on how to have a difficult conversation with a parent about their child's learning abilities. I think one of the most challenging things that Crossroads faces as a school is ensuring that the children come into a, um, a supportive environment early enough to get the help and support that they need. Um, and the biggest difficulty there is not that the, um, the teachers aren't telling the parents, uh, but it's, it's the parents actually are finding it too difficult to make that transition and to accept the loss that they experience. Um, and and what, that, what that means for them and what, the, what it means for the ideas they had for, for the children, um, the child that they, uh, think they had, thought they had, and accepting the child that they, that they now have. The child was always the same, obviously, um, but they had different ideas associated with it. So um, Olga and I were chatting about uh, the, the difficulty that parents experience, and I said, that's a great idea for a webinar. So here we are. <laughs> um, I think a, a very important message from, from my experience, just to start us off, is, is the stigmatization of learning difficulties and the labeling that we experience. Um, and our children experience and our, our parents hear a word or a term and they go, oi, that's not my child. Um, and how we can familiarize them more with those terms without them being labels. Um, we shouldn't refer to a remedial child, we should refer to a child with remedial needs. Um, we shouldn't refer to a dyslexic child, we should refer to a child with dyslexia. These are not labels, they're not identities, they don't become these scary entities um, with that label. And I think it's a, it's a very important aspect of um, the transition that we need to start familiarizing um, our parents with the language that's used um, to yeah, to be more, more supportive of, of them. And, and only we can do that because we're the educators. So this is what we know. I'm going to hand over to Olga to start us off. We're gonna have um, the first uh, half hour, 40 minutes of, um, of, of each person giving an overview from their perspectives. And then we're gonna have um, a question and answer session. If you have any particular questions that you'd like to put in, in the chat, I'll cover those at the end. Um, so I'm gonna hand over to Olga. Thank you very much again for joining us and I hope you enjoy the session. Thank you, Tessa. Good evening. Um, thank you all for attending this um, webinar. Um, I'm going to start off by saying it is really tough to have these conversations with parents. I think we all can identify it as educators to tell your um, parents that there might be a difficulty or a barrier to your child's learning it is a very anxiety provoking conversation to have. But then we must always also remember it's very tough for a parent to hear that. And the way we give our message can be received whether positive or negative. So um, 
especially when the child is still young. So we've been promoting a lot on early intervention, tell the parents as soon as possible, start with therapies to support the, your child's needs. But sometimes the reaction to that is not always so positive. Yes, you get the parent jump on board, they go for assessments or they help at home, go on the pro home program. But unfortunately, not always parents hear that, um, that there is a challenge um, since the first time you have the first conversation. So for example, um, so for a child that's two to three years old, I know there's a lot of um, conversations around language development and speech. Um, so um, when to refer them to a speech and language therapist. And then later on, if they if you see a motor difficulty to receive to an occupational therapy. And I must say, and this comes now from a parent who has a child with learning difficulties herself, plus being in a car park, at Bryce, at parties, and people chatting to you about how they experience the teacher or a preschool, or how do they um, see the development of their own children. And unfortunately, reactions of parents is not always positive, you know, and work with you and collaborate with your suggestions. You do get the parent that gets angry or is in denial or um, don't want to hear you, you know, and we have to be sensitive for that and to realize that <clears throat> And to realize for hearing the message, especially for the first time, is it makes some time, they might need to get some time to process it. And you might not say from the beginning exactly what you think is the problem. It will build over time. The reason for saying that is I've got an example. A very good friend of mine once phoned me in tears. Her son was 18 months old plus. It was the same. Um, and she said to me, Olga, the teacher told me my child is autistic. And she was just crying and it was just too much for her. And unfortunately, the way that message was delivered completely destroyed her in day one. And then her journey only started. And then um, she said, where do I start? Who must I see? You know, it was total chaos. And yes, the teacher was right at the end. Her son is autistic. But to say it the first time, in eight, on, a child, on an age of 18 months, straight to the mom like that, you know, it could have done maybe a little bit differently, like starting to say, what signs do you see? So I'm a strong believer when I'm speaking to parents, it's not just to say your child has a problem or your child struggles to read. I um, feel we have to give examples. We have to say why it is a problem and what we see and what we can do about it. For example, to tell, um, I think my daughter was about three and a half. The teacher just said to me, she needs occupational therapy because her pencil grip is not optimal. To be quite honest, if you're three and a half um, and your pencil grip is not optimal, I would see there's still some time for the child to develop that. But what you should have told me is, your child sits on the desk like this with the one foot up there. She can't stabilize herself. The shoulder, she's all over. She, um, she cannot sit still for a second, you know, and on top of that, she struggles to hold her pencil. Because at the end, it wasn't only the pencil grip that was a problem. It was a whole motor development problem. And I think it's all about how we deliver with examples for parents to hear why we are saying that the child might need extra support or has a specific difficulty. But as I said earlier, um, we can say it sometimes in the nicest way we think we want to because um, our pure passion is to help the child. But unfortunately, parents just hear what they want to hear sometimes. And we have to be respectful for that, but also keep on delivering the message. So the biggest challenge that I have is, yes, being compassionate and um, thoughtful, but also being truthful. So to have empathy you know, with a parent, but you also have to tell them, you know, that there is a certain difficulty. So the reactions of parents is um, quite interesting. Um, I'm going to give you a few examples. So um, it's a lot of the time the teacher's fault or the therapist's fault, you know. So if I hear um, sometimes the teacher is too young or sometimes the teacher is too old or she doesn't have time anymore or she lost her passion for teaching. And um, so there's sometimes all these excuses of why the child has a difficulty and, um, and that it's not always tackling the problem. Like um, my um, one friend said to me, oh, I bet after a parent feedback meeting, he said, oh, I bet the teacher's gonna say my child needs to go to OT. Then I thought, you know what? We've been having this conversation for three years now after your parent feedback session. So maybe go for an OT assessment and see what it is about, you know? so. And still, you know, parents still need that time to get used to the idea. 
And yeah, so just from my side is um, what I found with um, hearing people say is to always give an example of why you say there is a problem, you know, and where it comes from. And yes, you will get a negative reaction sometimes. It will be sometimes your fault or the um, the therapist fault, but in the end, your it's your gut as an educational uh, edu educator to um, to tell them what is um, the things that you are worried about, and then to be part of that journey. Because I always believe also they must have we almost must have a plan. So leave the parent with a plan to say, okay, right, let's assess this for the next three weeks or four weeks. We try um, two or three interventions, or I will get back to you in two months time. And there's lots of options. I mean, you can look at different therapies. Um, we can look at a bridging class um, before we get to remedial education. Um, are we going to consider a repeat here? And all of those things is part of the journey of um, how we're going to help our children to get through school. So, um, yes, yeah, so from my point is the most important thing is to be um, consistent in your feedback and do it regularly. You know, so parents don't hear it for the first time in November because um, sometimes they will say, nobody ever told me. And just to have also some sort of a paper trail that goes with that, because um, then it can also, um, as you as an educator can see, but look, in grade three, oh, in grade north, somebody said that, and then in grade one, they said the same. So there is some sort of a pattern. So um, yeah, so from my side, I know it is a tough um, conversation to have, but um, it is worth it at the end to help our kiddos. Georgina, I don't know if you want to jump in. Sorry, I'm just going to unmute myself. Thanks. Oh, yes, me. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> yes, me. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to go next. And Olga, I think she's uh, covered a lot already. So I'm sure some of the things I'll say will echo Olga's opinion on that. Um, I just like to say that I, I don't like to call this difficult conversations we have with parents, but rather really courageous conversations we're having coming from a teacher's perspective. So I think the first thing to acknowledge or tell yourself that this is going to be an extremely difficult conversation that you that the, you as a teacher is going to have with the parent so that you ment mentally prepare yourself. Because if you're going to go into this conversation that you're going to have, not preparing yourself as yourself mentally, you're not going to be able to convey that message that you tr truly want to convey. Um, so there are a few techniques that I think could be used when you are having these uh, conversations. Firstly is to acknowledge. You can acknowledge the parents' feelings saying, I understand where you're coming from, or um, if it means that you need to apologize for something that he, of, of your oversight. I think as soon as you acknowledge that feeling that the parent is having, you're already eliminating some of the stress and anxiety and anger that the parent might have towards the situation. So always just acknowledge and say, I understand where you're coming from, or is this what you mean? And then having an outcome or a goal, like Olga mentioned, always go with a plan. It's, it's pointless in saying, oh, your child can read and write and leave it as that that you need to go with a plan in mind. What you've done already, what you've seen already from your observations in the class, not only observations, but actual assessments, written assessments. If you have enough proof that the child is not coping, you need to have all of this on paper. And then from taking all your evidence, you need to then have a plan in place. Like um, mentioned before, whether it's a repeat year, whether you're looking at concessions, or um, um, other um, observations could also include uh, the child where she is socially, if you're noticing any levels of anxiety or avoidance, and then you can bring it back to the parent and find out if they are seeing the same thing at home. So if the two correlate, then obviously the parent can see that they're noticing some school avoidance in the morning or anxiety behind school, then you know, okay, you're dealing, you have a problem in front of you. And you, if you're both on the same page, 
you can move forward and find a, um, a plan. It's also always good to clarify what you understand. So if the parent is saying, um, comes up with a question, you, or you almost need to repeat that and say, is this what you mean? Or is this what you're asking me? But besides all of that, I find that parents are coming with faced with different personalities or professional backgrounds, and you need to see where they are at at their level of grief or acceptance. Are they ready to accept what you're telling them? Are they still in denial or are they angry? Are they depressed? And a lot of the time it comes to self-blame. You know, where is the parent at before you can continue having this discussion? And like Olga mentioned previously, maybe they're not ready to accept. Or maybe they're only going to hear you after the 10th time you've spoken to them. But that's okay. You're planting that seed slowly but surely. We as educators, sometimes I think we become so blindsided, blindsided by what we need to do. And we need to go back and check our level of empathy that we have. If, we have, if we're having this child that we've been hearing about from previous teachers, oh, he's so naughty and he's so disrespectful. Um, it's sometimes hard to then take them in the next grade without having that, taking that background information and, you know, so just check your level of empathy and not go on what previous teachers have said to some extent. Try to make up your own mind about them and be, while the parent is not there, try to be the advocate for that child. Try to, to pull out his strengths rather than just the weaknesses. And maybe in that way, us as teachers, we could develop more of a level of empathy. But coming back to stigma, like Tessa mentioned in the beginning, I'm also a parent with a child that has uh, difficulties. So the primary school years were fine for him because he attended a remedial school. He was diagnosed with cerebral palsy, but when we found that this stigma of having cerebral palsy really affected him was when he needed to apply for a grade eight school. And if I say I applied at every school I could in Johannesburg and the minute they saw cerebral palsy on his application, they turned us away. And I would go and say, please just give him a chance to have a look at what, he, what he's capable of. But I think because schools and teachers are so scared to go on this journey of what's required having a child with difficulties in your school, are we equipped enough to have that child? So I think they, the schools were faced with fears of, can they manage um, uh, access to the school grounds, physical uh, structure of the school? Could they help him access the curriculum because of things like concessions in place? But they didn't look further than that and give me as a parent a chance to say, he doesn't require all of that. His diagnosis is cerebral palsy, but he has come so far along that he is quite mobile and he is independent and academically he is achieving well. The minute they see the, the diagnosis, that's when schools get too scared and they feel that the child is not suitable. So I would just like all schools or to bring that back to the focus is go beyond the diagnosis, go beyond the stigma, give the parent a chance to explain or give the child a chance to prove what they're capable of. That's from my point. So I don't know, Andy, if you'd like to take over from there. Sure. Thank you, Yasmin. So good evening, everyone. Um, communicating with parents in a pediatric setting can be a stressful part of the collaborative therapy process, um, especially for new OTs or new educators. I think we all go into this prof uh, profession wanting to help the child and it's all about the child, but you don't realize that you have to deal with the parents, which can be really tricky and really difficult. And parents play an essential role in therapy outcomes as they must carry over the skills and the strategies used in the sessions, um, as well as in the child's environment at school um, to you know, transfer those skills at home to help the child. So working in different situations with different types of parents, um, parents will have questions about the child child's diagnosis that you are not always 
qualified to answer and that's also okay and parents don't always buy into occupational therapy and understand that we're there to rather support the child and build a solid foundation instead of looking at the child as there's something wrong with them and we really need to help them in that regard. So I think the beliefs regarding parent and family involvement in occupational therapy have evolved significantly over the last few decades. Um, traditionally, services were for children with disabilities or learning difficulties. They were child-centered, which is wonderful. But we also need to bring in the family and they are our biggest allies. They really take, you know, we see the child for 30 minutes to an hour a week, the, the majority of the time is with the educators and at home. So they really need to transfer those skills and we need to use our educators and our parents as allies. So a lot of the difficulties um, that we have, you know, in, in, or here are some strategies rather that I'd like to say when talking to parents is that you need to begin with the strengths of the child. I think sometimes we may be the first person telling the parent um, that they have some difficulties or they've heard the, the, the story or the difficulty so many times that we also need to start the conversation by saying that your child is actually really good at this and let's use these strengths um, to help the child better their performance or their involvement in the classroom. So making sure that you are giving positive feedback and you're reinforcing the parent's sense of competence and self-esteem. And um, this also helps to build rapport with your parents. I think parents will then start to trust you and understand that um, you're coming from a good place and that you're seeing the whole picture as a team rather than just you pinpointing the difficulties that are with the child. I think another tip is do not use jargon. A lot of the time we find that we will use our um, jargon from our own profession and a lot of the time you can get a miscommunication with this so parents don't necessarily always understand what you may be talking about um, so for example as an OT bilateral coordination not everyone knows what bilateral coordination is and how it's going to affect them in the classroom for example sensory processing a child you know a parent may not understand why a child needs to be regulated in order to uh, have a an optimal learning environment. So I think we need to stay away from using jargon or if you are gonna use jargon, just make sure that you explain it correctly to parents um, and that they get the full picture. Ask them if they understand what you're explaining and see if they do and give them um, a little bit more feedback or a little bit more um, of an understanding using an everyday language for them making sure that you provide appropriate and accurate information. So I think we go into this um, this profession and a lot of us are very gentle and soft. And I think what we can do is we tend to sugarcoat things. And I think communication can get lost with that. So just making sure that you provide appropriate and accurate information and then avoiding any kind of judgment. I think parents hearing that information is already difficult and then coming in with a, you know, you don't read at home enough or you don't help the child at home enough. You don't do our home program enough life happens and parents are incredibly difficult or they have a difficult and busy life. So trying to avoid that judgment and just making sure that you are there and making sure that they understand that you are they part of a team and asking for their experience as well. What they're seeing at home um, could really help to collaborate you guys as a team and making sure that what you're seeing in the classroom or in your therapy sessions, they are also seeing at home. And then you can start to have more of these difficult conversations together. Um, and I think we can go on to Georgina, if you want to say more to that. Sorry, just unmuting myself. <laughs> All right. Yeah, um, I think we've already like covered so much already just between the first three speakers. But just in terms of my experience as a psychologist, I'm usually the last person that um, has to deliver or confirm what the teacher is seeing. So oftentimes, you know, um, parents will, will come, you know, for an assessment. Um, obviously, things have been picked up at school and or, you know, they've been in therapy and, you know, they just want to know where to now. What do we do now? Where do I go for, you know, from here? 
so it's never easy um, for parent or for teacher or for psychologist because obviously, um, as Andrea also said, we, we are soft and we do want to uh, give them the message, but, but not um, sort of break all their, their sort of hopes and dreams because once they, they come to that, they, they are going through all the stages of what did I do wrong? Um, how could I have changed this? Or, um, you know, did I put them in the wrong school? Did I not provide enough um, stimulation? Or, you know, did I do something, you know, or again, the, the blame game teacher. And, and, and so they do go through all of that. Um, and, and sometimes they don't accept what the, the psychologist has to say, you know, I, I'm sorry, you're wrong, I'm going to get a second opinion. Um, so I think it's very hard for them uh, as parents to, to sort of um, accept that sort of message. So just for some tips of um, how to help parents accept their child's um, difficulty. Um, I think when you give them, well, if I give a diagnosis or, you know, as, as a teacher, if you're going to say, look, I've noticed this about your child, is always to deliver the message with a lot of compassion. Um, remember, you know, like you're a parent too, or, you know, like how, how do they want to receive that message? But also not dashing all the hopes, to have a, a message of hope in there too. Yes, I see he's struggling with this, but we have a solution or we can try this, um, which is similar to what, what Olga was saying. Just in terms of research findings, um, it shows that the manner in which a diagnosis is explained to parents can have a profound or prolonged effect on the parent's attitude towards their child and professionals. So it's, the, it's, it's all about that delivery. How do we how do we explain it to them um, and, and that sort of the way they are going to accept that message? So, again, not just not saying to your child, well, your child can't do this. Uh, no parent wants to, to hear that. They want to hear, yes, I see your child is having difficulty with this. What do you see? You know, what could we, we put into place? Um, I think building that sort of um, getting to know your parents um, as educators as well is sort of also getting um, you can't in the beginning of the year say to a parent well this is what I think um, you've got to get to know your parents and and see how they uh, respond to certain communication are they a type of parent where they need you to pick up the phone and say could we have a meeting or are they a type of parent where you can just chat to them on the phone or are they the parent that comes into your your class and says well can I have a word with you after school you know is it that sort of you know what what sort of do they need from you and um, I think it's also important to, to have the resources available. So if you, and, and this is similar to what Olga has also said, um, and to Yasmin, um, if you pick up a problem, give them a solution. Don't just say, you know what, your child's not coping, you know, give them some options, you know, like, let's let's do this, or, um, you know, I see that uh, there's a difficulty with, uh, as a, um, you know, with the, the, um, the fine motor coordination, or they seem to be slumping in their seats, you know, maybe we should look at going, you know, for a, 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 an OT assessment. Um, again, just um, what Olga was saying as well with, with delivering the message gently. So not everything at once, you know, saying I'm noticing this, and then progressing and don't just diagnose the child um, and say, you know, I think your child has this, you know, it's just saying, I've noticed this, have you noticed these behaviors, maybe we should explore it further. Um, and I think it's also very important, you know, that that um, parents are, are, are afraid of the unknown. And, um, and I think, uh, you know, we need to sort of be a little bit transparent in saying, you know, like I've done some research or I've looked at this and, you know, I've noticed this. 
um, maybe we should read up more about this or have a look at, you know, perhaps um, your child, you know, I'm just thinking of the, the diagnosis of, of autism is maybe saying, you know, I've noticed your child sort of prefers to play on their own, um, doesn't socialize with others, you know, is exhibiting, you know, have you considered going and, and you know, maybe um, I see, you know, Ask, speaking to a professional um, and, and like I say I think um, another thing that, that Yasmin um, touched on is, is, is trusting your instinct and, and, and trusting your knowledge because um, yes parents will be defensive well well I know my child better than you um, but but having to knowing and your experience of teaching children being able to um, you know in your heart what they should be doing at that age you are the expert um, but not coming across as expert but saying you know if I look at other children in this age group um, I see you know this is an area of difficulty but um, the other important thing is that there are lots of different strategies lots of different ways of um, managing this so it's not a straight case of well your child has a difficulty I think we should just send them to a remedial school um, is rather to look at the options what could we try um, and I think when you when you when you say to parents you know like how about trying this I think they are more open to um, you know okay I, you know let's let's try this see if this works and and that, like I say, builds up that sort of um, those steps to saying, well, you know what, we've tried this, and this is hasn't worked, or we we've tried this, but let's you know um, see what else we can do, and and that sort of builds that rapport with those parents, and they then feel they're not in it alone because that is often um, another thing is parents feel like. I'm all alone with this. This is now my child and I've got no support. And I think that's very important is not to just deliver the message and leave them, you know, well, this is your problem. You've got to sort it out. Is to give them that support and maybe, you know, get, you know, put them in contact with other parents that are experiencing similar things um, and have like a little bit of a parent support um, group for them in terms of like, just what did you experience well I've also experienced this and and I think um a big thing that our parents do go through is is they grieve um and and that's something we have to understand that once they get to that um acceptance you know um they've got to go through the processes of 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 grieving of being angry of um you know, being afraid, what is the future for my child? Um, so I think, uh, you know, the biggest one for me is that grieving process where they, you know, they, they almost feel like um, all the dreams I had for the child are now dashed. And that's where we've got to come in with that message of hope. No, they're not dashed. Yes, your child will learn in a different way, or it'll maybe take them a little bit longer to get their reading on to that level so I think that's when we 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 give that message um is to have that that aspect of hope because I think that's what our parents also need um in in terms of, of that and yeah I, I think uh, the best thing I can say is is you know that that level of of compassion being empathetic and um but also having knowledge behind you like not just saying well this is it but having that knowledge behind you to say well this is what we could do um this is you know the steps we're going to take because then i think the parents are more open um to to sort of um hearing that and like i say i think you know you, you need to give them that message more than once because they have to digest it um, and I think it's 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 too much to give them everything in one moment. But I think you have to, and that was another thing that Olga said. I think honesty is very important um, to be honest about what you are seeing because we do a, a, the child a disservice if we do not tell the parents. You know what this is what we, you know if we shy away from these difficult conversations because it makes us feel awkward. We are doing the child a disservice. 
And yeah, I think that covers it from everybody. <laughs> Okay, Georgina, thank you very much. And thank you very much, Yasmin and Andrea and um, Olga. You've covered a lot of information. What I'm going to ask you now is um, some questions from each of you uh, from your perspectives. Um, just one point that I'd like to uh, make a recommendation on is at the beginning of your year, I think most, most schools and most classes have an introductory session to the families. Um, so you meet with the parents, uh, before before you meet with the uh, or in your first or second week of, of school and you have an introductory section session of how your class will, will work. It's a really good idea to discuss generally how you work as a teacher um, and to when you're speaking about um, sports and academics because we know how you know sports are far more important than anything else in the school. So sports, and then you throw in some academics and what your expectation is in the classroom. Um, but then also, you know what, we also need to, 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 to discuss when your child has a learning difficulty. So when your child has a learning difficulty, I'm gonna have a conversation with you. Um, and what it does is it introduces a concept that, that parents often don't think of. So um, if you think of the first time, you know, you might've fallen pregnant and, um, you didn't know any, anyone who was pregnant before you, but then suddenly you start noticing everyone who's pregnant, and there's so many pregnant people. You know what? They were all there before. <laughs> you just didn't notice them. They weren't in your realm of vision because it, because it wasn't on your radar until it happened to you. So it's the same thing with a learning difficulty. It's only on your radar when it's in your realm of noticing. Um, and it's it's so so um, having that conversation upfront. At the beginning of the year, you can then refer back to it when you need to have that conversation with that one parent. And you can say, remember, I spoke to you at the beginning of the year and, and I said that I would have a difficult conversation with you about a learning, you know, something that was maybe going, going wrong. This is that conversation. This is what we need to talk about. It softens the blow. It softens the, um, the, the, the message. So I think, um, Georgina, you have actually answered all of the questions that you asked. <laughs> so I'm going to have to, um, to jump to uh, Andrea. I'd like to ask you a question about OT. In the earlier years of, um, in, in the younger age groups, children are often referred to OT as a first port of call. In your opinion, when do you um, notice difficulties? challenges that need additional help um, and and how do you manage that as an OT uh, if that child will need other support for example from an ed psych or from a speech therapist or if you need to have a conversation with a parent how would you manage that? Um, so I think it's quite a difficult thing um, to decide when a child has difficulties and when they really need to start seeing the specialists and really when you need to get all this information. I think it's very dependent on the child. It's very dependent on the parents. I think you can pick up on a child having difficulties at four or five. Maybe you see a few red flags um, and you may mention this to the parents and say, you know, I'm not a specialist. I'm not a doctor. We need to get uh, a neurologist involved because there's a little bit more here that we need to explore. Sometimes our parents are not always open to hearing that. So you need to make sure that they know as, uh, uh, as an occupational therapist that you are a team and you can say, that's fine. I do understand that this is something hard for you to hear and it's hard to digest. Um, we have picked up these difficulties or these red flags. I think we need to explore it in the future. Let's monitor it for now. Let's see if we can maybe um, look at it as more of a, I want to say something that we don't have to be so aggressive with. We can monitor the progress and then in six months time, let's revisit this um, because then they might be a little bit more open to saying, okay, actually we haven't seen any changes in the, in the child. Um, we, we are picking up the difficulties at home that you are mentioning. Now is our time to, to revisit this. So I think Picking up on difficulties is hard to say because it can be as early as two, three in developmental milestones, or it can be five, six in terms of attention and concentration, but you have to treat each case individually and uniquely and make sure, like we've all said, 
knowing how your parents are going to react, bringing out the information that I'm not a specialist. This is your first point of call, which is great. I'm glad that the educator has referred you to OT, but let's explore more options because this doesn't seem to be rectifying or it's more of a dysfunctional thing. So the child may be very active or have a lot of energy, but it's not um, affecting their performance within the classroom. So then it's something that we don't really need to explore. Um, but if it is now becoming dysfunctional or a difficulty that the child is having within the learning environment, within their occupations of life, then is when we start to explore other alternatives um, in terms of a neurologist, an expert, uh, whichever way we need to go into, we'll then start to explore that. Thanks, Andy. Did I That's answer good. everything? Sorry. Yeah, good. Um, Olga, I'd like to ask you a question around um, when a child is not meeting developmental milestones and um, when is it a, a concern from a developmental point of view versus a learning difficulty point of view? And is I know there's no fine line, but what, what guidance can, can you give in the differentiation? Because I think from our experience, we get so many applications in grade three where suddenly the child hasn't met certain criteria and then it's, oh, we urgently need to get them into a remedial school. So what, are the, um, what is the advice that you can give to educators to give to their parents on what is developmental versus not? Okay, um, that is quite an uh, um, interesting question. Um, the thing is, developmental milestones, um, I think as an educator, you know, more or less a child of five years must do this, a child of five and a half should say this on a verbal level or in their functioning. But I mean, children do develop in their own time, so it's quite a balance. But what I feel is if you see that there's no progress, even if you've already put um, some input. Let's say, for example, um, the child started to attend extra reading sessions or speech therapy or things like that, and there's no progress, then I would say it is then um, useful to, um, to refer on to um, the next specialist to see whether how big is the gap, and then if they are coping in the current environment where they are at with the support that they are receiving, or if it is the correct environment. What we've seen is, and I think that's also what you referred to, is um, now in um, at Crossroads, when we're doing the admissions and things, we get children grade three, grade four that's coming into the school. And, um, and sometimes, you know, um, I have a little boy in my classroom this year, and the progress that is made from January up to now is amazing. I mean, yes, he still needs a lot of support with reading. But then I said to, actually, as me the other day, I wish he came to us sooner. Because I think if he came to us in grade one or not, then the gaps might have been smaller and he actually will be able, might have mainstreamed by now. So it depends from child to child. But in his case, yes, um, he had difficulties with reading and with his language, uh, with the mechanical side of reading. But if those building blocks was um, supported sooner, um, he might have been already um, ready to move on to a mainstream setting this year or the next year. So, um, so it depends again from child to child, but um, I just sometimes are worried if we see the gap, we must just check that it's not getting bigger and bigger and bigger, rather to check, yeah, we have the gap now and let's see if the support that we're giving, is it enough, you know, for the child to stay in the environment, is the child growing, but if we're not going forwards and if the child is not making progress, then we must see where the difficulty is at, what other interventions or support the child might need. Thanks, Olga. Yasmin, um, is, there, is there something you can do to assist parents um, who are refusing to hear the message? So I think it's now negatively impacting the child. This is one of our questions. Um, yeah. Yeah. Now, I think a lot of it has been said before. It depends where the parent is at their level of grief and acceptance. I mean, we can't force the issue. We can't force them to accept it. But the more we say to them in, to, in a gentle way, um, planting that seed, we hope that they would accept it sooner or later. But also, um, I think 
Some parents need to physically see that their child is not coping. And when they get that report and they see only twos and threes, it might come as a shock to them, but this might be the only time that they're ready to accept, like this is a problem and come forward to the teacher and find out where the problem is. So like you said, because of different parenting styles and parenting personalities, sometimes a parent needs to physically see where their child is at. Show them the books, show them what's been done in class and show them how the child is not coping. Also having read previous reports, if the parent has taken the child for assessments to an OT or speech therapist, make sure that you've used that recommendations that the OT has said or that the speech therapist has said. And if you put that into place, then you can also go back to the parent and say, we've tried all of this and your child is still not um, accessing the curriculum. So make sure that you have evidence, make sure that you can show the parent where their child physically is at, because sometimes by just saying it, they don't hear you, they need to see it for themselves. But it really depends on where the parent is at emotionally at that time. And I think parents are so anxious in becoming more so after the COVID years that it's more difficult to have those conversations with them. And like we were talking earlier, and like you mentioned, Tessa, from the time you're pregnant, you're already anxious. Am I eating the right things? Am I doing the right things? Because you expect your child to grow up to be this doctor or lawyer, but we need to also tell parents that the world wasn't meant to have only doctors and lawyers. You know, we need all children from all different uh, backgrounds and strengths and weaknesses. And just keep on going back to what they can do and then pointing out to where their difficulties are. But really, I think physically showing them evidence of the report of their work, and then hopefully that would help them see that where their next step should be. Thanks, Yasmin. That's very. It's a. It's a very insightful comment. Um, Georgina, I'd like you to answer the question: um, How to help parents come to terms with the acceptance of a child's difficulty? Um, <laughs> okay, so it, it's quite difficult to to let them come to terms with it um, in terms because of the stages that they're going through in terms of what they you know their expectations are, and I think. Um, in order to do that is you've got to give them the options or the, you know, this is, this is the difficulty your child is experiencing. Um, how, you know, how can we assist your child to, to reach that potential? Because obviously as an educational psychologist, we look at the child's potential. So uh, we're looking at one aspect of, of the child and we can sort of see where the difficulties perhaps lie. So um, I think in terms of helping the parents come to terms that is, is giving them what the future could look like. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean right, your child's going to be in a mainstream school and, and as Yasmin says, going to become a doctor or a lawyer. Um, but to say to them, you know what, um, your child, your child, I always use the, I like to use the term that your, your child is wired differently and everybody is uniquely wired and your child's brain is, works this way. And because your child's brain works this way, you need, you know, this kind of support or this, this is what makes reading difficult for your child. Or, um, you know, maybe your child's working memory is, is an area of weakness. That's why your child finds it difficult to, to learn um, or to remember what the teacher has said in the class. Um, so using those sort of um, areas, but then saying, well, this is what we can do about it. Um, you know, so that this is not the end, this is just the beginning. This is, your child is on a different journey and this is what we're going to put into place to get them to the same end point. Um, and I think that sort of helps them come to terms with, you know, this is, it's not over. We just need to, to go a different route. And I think for a lot of parents, um, once they've come to acceptance, um, and I think uh, a lot of, we see that with a lot of our parents, once they've 
they've sort of accepted that there's almost a sense of relief um, in that okay I have a plan okay I understand why my child is doing you know learning differently and once they come into a school like Crossroads or, or get the support um, and they see you know the progress that's being made there's that sense of of you know like I can relax um, you know and and a lot of our parents, you know, you've spoken about stigma. They do come in with that sort of sense of like, you know, my child is going to be stigmatized. But once they, um, a lot of our children that are in Crossroads don't want to leave because once they get here, it's almost like they can breathe. And, um, you know, the school is catered to your child's needs and it's not your child has to fit into the school system. So I think for them, once they, they realize that this is you know the support my child needs it's easier to come to terms with that you know in terms of when they see the child um doing better um because oftentimes we see the other knock-on effect with the anxiety and when they're not coping they're misbehaving or other behaviors sort of um come to to light when a child is feeling like they're not um, secure in the environment so i think um just in in terms of that i think once parents see that things fall into place and they've got the support that they need and they are feeling supported, I think it's easier for them to come to terms with, you know, the prognosis. Thanks, Regina. Okay, last word from everyone. It's 24 minutes past six. We've done very well. We've put a lot of information into this um, hour. Last word from everyone. Olga. Sorry, I just see there's a question in the stream about... Um, if, um, if you should say whether a child is um, dyslexia or if you have to refer to a um, specialist. Yeah. And um, this is um, my personal opinion. So um, be very careful to give diagnosis, especially yeah. about dyslexia, because um, there's a lot of different opinions of what the dyslexia is, number one, you know. And the second thing is um, with a diagnosis like that, it can be um, or the child gives up hope because we've got a lot of children that tells us, oh, I can't do it because I'm dyslexic. We hear that a lot. I can't read because I was told I'm dyslexic, you know. So, and for them to understand, yes, you have a difficulty with reading, but it doesn't mean that you cannot read at all. So my safe way is to go to rather say, your child has a difficulty with reading, you know, instead of saying your child is, as, is it's a child with dyslexia. So, um, yes, you can do assessments and there is a dyslexia screening test that will say your child is at risk for dyslexia. But in the end, um, just be very careful to use labels like that because um, we also, um, what I also see a lot, and it's not only one child, they will say, oh, I can't do it because I'm dyslexic. Or the other one is I can't do it because I have ADHD, you know, and um and there it gets quite difficult to build up their motivation and then self esteem and things like that because they've labeled themselves, if I can put it like that. And then um, you have to work through that hurdle again. So um, I would be um, very careful to use terms like um, dyslexia because it can be um, quite a negative term, term for parents and for teachers. Like, for example, I once actually had had a mom um it's a few years ago and I said to you he really battles to read and to write and you know he really struggles to give his best you know and he gets stuck on this she said but all guy has dyslexia so he, he cannot he cannot do that you know and actually he was quite an able child he was able to read he was able to do written expression expression and tasks like that so it's then again just to be careful you know that the children don't not use it as an excuse, but it also is not good for their confidence. Mm -hmm. So that's just on my side. <laughs> Thanks, Olga. I think that's a valuable um, point to make. It goes back to the, the point about labels um, and not labeling uh, with an identity as and um, actually using the, the verb. Um, yeah. Yasmin, last word from you. Oh, sorry, Olga. No, it's fine. <laughs> Yes, so for me, I think just coming back to um, constantly going back and re-looking at our level of empathy as teachers, because it's easy to go on what previous teachers 
said or feel about a certain child and then going on with that. So I think for me, it's just always starting the year afresh, giving the, the child or the person a new opportunity. You know, there's always second chances. There's always a better outlook, a better way to look at the difficulty or the behavior. So always going back and um, keeping ourselves as teachers on check. Great, thanks. Thanks very much, Yasmin. Andy? Um, I think just a, a going away message is just being patient with our parents. I think they really, it's a lot to hear these difficulties and especially when it comes to your own child. Um, I've had a lot of kids that come through and the parents will say, oh, he's in grade three. Um, but we've heard from grade one and grade two, these are his difficulties. We've decided to seek OT now. So really just allowing the parents to digest the information. It may take long. It may take longer than you expect. We need to put our egos aside and put the child first. Um, that's our biggest priority. And just making sure that you, you listen to the parents and create um, a team environment, making sure that they don't feel alone, that you're there for them. You can make plans together um, and you can help them throughout the rest of the world the journey really so just ensuring that you're a good team and being patient with them great thanks andy georgina okay i just um also want to confirm what what um olga said in terms with uh the question about dyslexia um dyslexia is an umbrella term so yes it gets used quite um widely you know and and it does need an expert to diagnose um so yeah and because it, there's other areas you know dyspraxia and dyscalculia and all of that that fall underneath that so yeah as teachers yes you know um, mention that you have noticed these things but yeah I never diagnose or say you know even myself as a psychologist I will always stick within my scope and say, you know what, I, um, you know, I see these aspects, but you know, I would then refer to a specialist. So, um, just my go away or uh, message is, um, again, yeah, that that sort of level of, of of compassion and and meeting the parents at where they're at, knowing that, um, you know, gauging. Uh, when you can tell a parent a message or where they're at at that time. So um, every time you communicate with your parents, just sort of see, get a sense of where they're at. Are they open to this message? Um, is this the right time to sort of, you know, talk to them about um, the child? Is it the right place? Because um, like I say, sometimes parents corner you. Um, so just make sure that when, when you deliver a message, you know, you, it's in the right space at the right time. Um, and um, also just having that knowledge behind you of, of what you are offering, you know, in terms of um, giving them solutions, giving them options um, and, you know, uh, also having a toolbox of who can they speak to like um you know having a referral for an ot or a speech or a, you know psych or, you know so that you have that for them as well um just not giving them a message and leaving it with them so i suppose for me it's about that support about giving them the message but saying i'm not gonna just leave it here i'm with you on this journey and we're gonna find a solution for it Thanks, Regina. I think a, a, an important point to note, and I know that we're two minutes over time, so apologies for that. Um, but I think an important point to note is the, the relationship of trust that you build with your parents. So at Crossroads, we talk about having a triangular relationship. Um, and to complete the triangle, you can't only have two sides. It cannot be the parent and the child. It cannot be the school and the child. It cannot be the school and the parent. Um, it's got to be all three parties to create that that complete triangle. And um, in that, that relationship of, of trust, we are sharing information, we're talking to each other and, and we're building up this rapport. So, so we can talk about um, various things. Remember, we are educators. I say we, I'm not, but they are um, educators and all of you are. And um, we are here to educate children in the most important phase of, of their lives where they are meant to make mistakes, they're meant to learn from their mistakes, they're meant to grow. 
And if they're having difficulty in their learning abilities, then surely we should be teaching them the skills to cope with those, those difficulties to live a better life and improve their learning abilities. So just that relationship of, of trust that you can create with your, with your, um, your parents um, and, and, and also to let them know that, that we don't earn any, um, any money <laughs> from referrals <laughs> and um, Crossroads doesn't take uh, any partnership funding. I think maybe that's a model we should look at. Um, but seriously, it, it is something that we don't, uh, there's no benefit to, to the teachers to refer um, a child. The only benefit is actually for that child. And that's really why we're hosting this webinar. Um, so thank you very much to everyone for, for joining us. I don't think there are any more questions in the chat, uh, but we are over time. I will send this recording out to everyone. Um, and please, if you know of any other educators, we really want to uh, share the message of what learning difficulties are and how we can support you. Um, and yeah, please share this webinar link uh, with them and they can watch themselves. Okay, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks team, see you tomorrow.